All right. We are back, and I see a familiar face up there on the screen. It's good to see you, Jamie. Um, it's my privilege to introduce to you Jamie Dom, who's going to speak to us about digital evangelism. Today, um, I was going to read the paragraph telling us about what she's going to present, but you'll find that out just by listening. Yeah. And what I'd rather do, um, Jamie, you and I know each other because we both had the privilege of serving on the Hope Sabbath School panel in the past. And before I was in Texas, I sat regularly with you in the studio up yeah. there and we yeah. participated in that ministry together. And even though I knew you through Hope Sab School and in the studio, there's so much I didn't know about you, I've learned because I just <laughs> read your bio. And um, as I was reading your longer bio, yeah. I learned so many things. And with your permission, I know it will cut a little bit into your time, but I think it's really valuable for our hearers to know who it is that's presenting to them. So I'm going to actually read your longer bio as a way of introduction, and then I'll have a prayer and uh, turn the time over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, let's do that. So Jamie Dom has over 15 years experience in developing and implementing results-focused digital marketing strategies for nonprofits. Most recently, she worked at the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists as the digital strategist for a new department, social media plus big data, that conduct, uh, connects members and mission through technology. During her time at the NAD, she developed social media policies, devised comprehensive digital strategies for major initiatives, trained departments and ministries to run their own digital communications, helped launch new digital ministries, promoted conferences and events to increase attendance, and created an extensive resource website, sdadata.org, for individuals, churches, conferences, and organizations interested in digital evangelism. We'll give you that uh, website again in case you didn't catch it. Mm -hmm. Additionally, she published her first book, Digital Discipleship and Evangelism, that serves as a practical guide for outreach, community service, growth, and evangelism. Jamie, I noticed you said you published your first book there, so I'm assuming that means we can look forward to more coming as well. That's good. Um, God willing. Here's some more stuff that I've learned about you that I didn't know before. Previously, Mrs. Dom worked at Smithsonian Associates, the world's largest museum-based education program, where she contributed significantly to the, the Associates becoming the uh, becoming revenue neutral for the first time in 50 years. While with the, the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra earlier in her career, she received national recognition for her work in the emerging field of digital strategy, and the orchestra was re, uh, recognized for its technological achievements in communications. I'm sure they appreciate you very much, Jamie. Mrs. Dom is dedicated to creating digital disciples and believes that the next great awakening will be online. She conducts online trainings, speaks at conferences, and advocates for young digital missionaries. Committed to training and mentoring young people, she offers guidance and coaching to those interested in digital communications or evangelism. Mrs. Dom is also an accomplished musician, student of the Bible, and avid reader. She was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 2007 and lives with her husband and daughter in Virginia. She frequently appears as a panelist on Hope Sabbath School. Most recently, she and her husband launched Angels in the Glen, an independent digital ministry that serves to guide men and women around the world to a deeper understanding of end-time prophetic truth so that they will be ready for the soon return of Jesus Christ. And then there's some uh, business website and the ministry website, which I just mentioned, um, and we can share those with our viewers later. But Jamie, wow, God has done some uh, pretty cool things in your life. You've uh, been given opportunities to grow and learn in this digital world. And I think we're going to really be blessed by what you're about to share with us. So thank you for being with us. Let me just have a word of prayer as we begin. Father, thank you for um, the time that we can spend together uh, through technology, and we're glad that uh, you've given Jamie such a rich background of um, experience and training that she can now share with us to improve our 
ability to reach people through digital media and to do discipleship digitally. We just pray that you will bless our time together now. Keep our minds attentive. Help us to soak in all the good things that we can learn. And bless Jamie as she presents to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And thank you for having me here today. And I'm excited to actually get to go after uh, Dr. Hartman because we're going to be taking some of his ideas and we're going to talk about how you can do that digitally. Because if you are online, you have influence and what you do with that influence matters. So digital discipleship and evangelism is basically a means by which individuals, churches, conferences, any kind of ministry, anybody, organizations can become reach vehicles for souls by using the technology to share the gospel message and practically improve the lives of others. And we're going to talk about real briefly about how that is actually following the model that Jesus set forth. So let me make sure I get my slides up here. Okay. And just so you guys know, the, there are going to be resources that are made available um, that you'll be able to download from the website. And this presentation will also be made available. So you'll be able to do that. So we're going to do a quick summary because I think you guys are all on board. We're going to talk about transitioning because our goal here is to move from those passive viewers to move from the Laodicean, you know, pew warmers. We're not even pew warmers anymore. We're online passive viewers to active digital disciples and what it means to, to use these technologies to practically improve the lives of others and share the gospel message and minister to people. So we're going to talk about the reframing commitments you can make. There's a downloadable. You guys can use it to, you know, hopefully create your digital discipleship teams um, and to think about, you know, basically that checklist of those commitments you can make. And well, now we're going to get into the practical, what it means to be a digital disciple and how you build community, how you improve the well-being of others, and how you share the gospel in digital spaces. So I really like this quote, actually. It's, um, if necessity is the mother invention, disconnect um, is the father of progress. And so it's really interesting is, as we know, and I'll just, I won't spend a lot of time on this, COVID has changed our life forever. And while I do not believe that God causes the bad things, I believe he uses them because I believe he has closed the church's doors because we need to figure out how to do church outside of a building that meets twice a week, that we should be a 24-7 kingdom that's actively engaged in our community, actively connecting with other people and actively sharing the gospel and ministering to people. And we can now do this from a click of a button from our couch we don't even have to go outside and it can be very powerful i've seen this working in real life now digital discipleship is based off the model that jesus set and it can be embraced by anyone and we'll talk about this in a moment but it doesn't matter how tech savvy you are or how tech savvy you aren't if you want to get involved and you have some connection online you can do this but so let's ask yourself what did jesus do jesus thought first to fulfill people's needs, then he bid them come and follow. So we often go about digital missions backwards. First of all, we advocate everything to the formal institution, and I believe that we all have a personal role. Um, but we mostly use these tools to invite people to events, but not for ministering to them. So Jesus didn't promote the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't go around and saying, hey, guys, I'm going to do the sermon. It's going to be great. You should bring a friend. What did he do? Time and time again, when I read the gospel, when I read the New Testament, I see Jesus meeting people where they were with the emotional, the physical, the spiritual, whatever challenge or felt need they had, he met them with that felt need. Then he bid them come and follow. And so that's what we're talking about doing today. And if you want to get like more specifically what he did, this is where social media is a perfect alignment. It's, you know, he shared stories. I mean, I just caught the last part of Dr. Hartman's sermon, but he was talking about sharing sharing testimonies. Those are stories. Those are powerful. It shows how faith is relevant in your daily walk, how faith helps you live your best life. You can share your own stories or stories of others. You can share godly wisdom. If people are searching for, you know, a moral compass or direction in this world, they're searching for how do I live life? How do I deal with these challenges from a Christian perspective? 
you know, he attended to people's needs physically and spiritually. We can do that through digital tools and technologies. And I'll give examples at the end if you guys want to see. He answered people's questions regarding spiritual mentors' everyday challenges. You know, people go online to learn, to seek answers to the problems. Are we, are we not only providing content that answers those questions, but are we a voice that answers back? He gave them hope. He created community. He developed an engaged, active church body. We all should be engaged. We all are called to be disciples. He led people to hold his any course. He equipped disciples and taught them to replicate the model that he set forth. So, again, I'll just be briefly, but I'll always remember March 15, 2020, because I had been very sick that week. And I woke up and my phone was just blowing up because not only the world was shutting down, everybody was, you know, asking me, what do we do or, or whatever. But what was really causing it to blow up was I was an admin over 50 Christian or ministry websites and social media profiles and all this kind of stuff. And the same question kept coming up. Where is your God now? Where is your God? Like for some reason they were coming to us and blaming us for what was going on or mocking us. And we know that mockers and scoffers will come in the last days. I expected that. I didn't expect it that day and in this context. But it got me thinking about the answer. And so like I realized was God was on the move while we were stuck at home. I believe God, like I said before, he's using COVID. Because in the first century, the apostolic church took the gospel to new regions of the world not necessarily because they wanted to, but a lot of them were being pushed out of their homelands and taking it to new lands because of persecution. And again, I don't think God caused the persecution. I don't think he caused the bad things, but he used it to fulfill his purpose. And so we must find a way to extend the church experience beyond the confines of time and space in a physical building. It should be a thriving 24-7 kingdom that meets those physical, those spiritual, those emotional needs of its community. And we have to reignite, you know, not just the apostolic church, but the early spirit of the Adventist church with a grassroots movement that starts with involvement from individual members. We all have a role and responsibility. And if you, you know, read my book, you'll see that I think there's different roles and responsibilities depending on whether you're an individual, your church, your conference, whatever it is. Now, I'll say this, and I'll, I'll say this many, many times, um, probably throughout this series, but it doesn't matter if you have four followers or 40,000. And this is something I want you to remember. I really want this to stick with you. You have influence. Even if you just can text people, if you just have email, whatever it is, you can use what you have to reach people within your sphere of digital influence with our messages of hope and wholeness. Because not doing it means you reach zero. So if you can only reach four people, that's great. That, that's, you know, four times improvement. You know, it's, an, it's important for each of us to realize our potential in this area. And as much as the world has changed, some things remain the same. We are called to be witnesses instead of pew warmers and now online watchers. We are to be centers. Not only our churches in the community, but as individuals, we are to be centers for positive influence, to be co-workers with the Holy Spirit to build God's kingdom. And I know some of you might still be dealing with a little bit of hesitancy. Well, isn't social media dangerous? Well, here's the thing. When has danger ever stopped us from going into the physical mission field? Physical danger never, people will risk their lives, they'll risk their health, they'll go halfway around the world and they will cut themselves off from their loved ones to share the gospel message because eternity is at stake. Social media, yes, there are pitfalls, there are dangers, there are problems. But just like, you know, people are willing to risk their physical life, we have to be smart about it, and I'll provide some resources for that, but it has never stopped us. Danger has never stopped us from entering the, the physical mission field, and I, and I am imploring you that the digital mission field is no less important. This is, I hope and I believe, is the final mission field, and it's the biggest country in the world, and it's the vastest, and we all have something that we can offer. And, and, and what's really interesting, too, is, you know, in, in Exodus 4, God asked Moses, what is in your hand? And Moses had a shepherd's staff, just a simple staff. You know, it could, in general, it was a neutral tool. It could be used for good or for evil to hit, harm, or lead and protect. But with God in the mix, here's the key. That same staff performed the miracles and led God's people out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt. Now, I believe God is asking us 
that same question. What is in your hand and what is in our hands is a device. It's a, it's a laptop, it's a computer, it's an iPad, it's a phone that can text people, you know, whatever it is. And what we do with them is what is good or bad. How we use them determines whether it's dangerous or safe. Like, you know what I mean? We can, with God in the mix, these tools can reach people around the world and free them from the bondage of the slavery of sin. And, you know, I've, we're facing, without a doubt, the biggest communication shift in 500 years. And, yes, more churches are online. They're streaming their, surface, their services, but it is not enough. We, you know, we have to do more. Watching your service online is enough. We must adapt. We must personally get involved. We are at a pivotal moment in which we could choose to be part of a digital revolution for the gospel. And just as those Protestant reformers, who remember 500 years ago with the printing press, the Gutenberg Bible, and the, the Gutenberg Revolution, which played a big role in the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant reformers leveraged the printing press to, to share the gospel, to spread their messages. So we must use digital tools to share our messages and fulfill our individual roles. And it has never been more affordable for an individual to share the gospel message. It doesn't have to cost a thing. Just your time, just your effort. And, you know, as I said, this shift is going to have to require everyone. So in today's presentation, I'm talking to the individuals, but churches can actually, you know, create groups of digital disciples within them and work at, work as a church unit. But whether you're an individual or a church listening to this, you have a role. And I firmly believe that the next great awakening will be a digital and a global one that's going to take everybody engaged in digital discipleship and evangelism to share our faith and spread the three angels message with that loud voice to the ends of the earth. And we can start by reaching those within our own spheres of digital influence, no matter how small, no matter how big, we can reignite that grassroots mentality that founded the Adventist church. So, but it's going to require a major shift in thinking. So how do we make that transition? You know, how do we transition a viewer to a digital disciple? How do we change our own mindset? Because, you know, as Christians, not just Adventists, but we, we've put up silos between our faith and our life lived online and our life lived online should should showcase our faith. So how do, how do we change that mentality? Well, you know, we need digital disciples who intentionally build relationships with non-members online and look for those opportunities to serve. The te Bible tells us to become and make disciples. So we can set examples ourselves and identify others in the church, you know, lay members in the church or, you know, leaders in the church who can be digital disciples with you. We can build a team to support each other in our congregations in this new mission field. We can advocate to make room for and empower members to engage in this kind of ministry and discipleship in a way that aligns with their passions their spiritual gifts, their tools of preference, and their personal style. We can make room for it. We can legitimize it with our language. You know, this is especially an important way to validate the natural talents of our youth and to include them. These people are, the, the youth are digital natives, and we can encourage them to use their unique skills for kingdom building because they are in the best possible position to reach their own generation. They understand the language in a way that we never can. <laughs> You know, this, and this is where the role of leadership can really become so important. So empowering our members begins with the vision we cast, whether we're on our own or we serve in an official leadership position in our local churches. As leaders, elders, and individuals, we can include digital discipleship in short and long-term visions and goals. You dedicate funds if possible and needed. It, oftentimes you don't actually need funds for it. Um, you can dedicate and encourage time for training you and others. So, you know, share this video with others. You know, download the resources and share them with others. And use it to brainstorm and come up with, you know, a strategy for what you want to do. You can identify talented people who can take on social media as a personal ministry. And this one's huge. Invest in young people. Give them space to be creative and to utilize their talents. It's going to look different, but that's okay. They understand how to speak to their own generation, and they are the most likely at-risk generation to leave. They need to lead in reaching their own generation. So we can encourage it. We can uplift them and their efforts as digital ministries. Of course, we can legitimize it. 
and the way we talk about it. We can cult cultivate a culture of creativity and sharing in digital spaces where people don't feel afraid to do something creative or put themselves out there, that they're encouraged and empowered. Don't criticize efforts, you know, if, if it doesn't look quite the way you'd like it to be. You can form a team to share ideas and experiences. Of course, there's tons of free resources out there. I always say you can Google my job. You really can. But there's the fcadata.org website, and there's also my own website that has some resources up there, and as well as the book. So you might be saying, but who, what is a digital disciple? Well, in short, a digital disciple is one who advances the gospel message in the digital space around a digital tool or by utilizing uh, or a digital need around a digital need or by utilizing a digital tool but here's the thing that's really important it's using digital tools to improve the lives of others and to share the gospel and here's what you should remember what starts in the digital space is not confined to the digital space especially after covid we live our lives integrated and interwound with technology this is how we live our lives so as a digital disciple you can be in the content creation pool the distribution pool or the engagement care pool so content creation is of course creating content whether it's videos or images or sharing stories whatever we all can do that we can all share our personal stories through our social media channels distribution that's simply sharing that's that's sharing your church's sermon or a video or a post or some, someone else even if it's not your own engagement and care that's building that community engaging relationships and we're going to talk about more about what that looks like and actually investing time in people's lives in digital spaces so for too long Digital tools and technologies have been viewed as incompatible with the gospel in our faith. So it's to me, that's like saying, we don't like this country. We're not going to go witness to them. It's like Jonah and Nineveh. Like, it's dangerous. Don't go there. And that, and, and that is the wrong mindset. We must reframe. So to grow as digital disciples, we need to reframe how we view time spent in the digital space to maximize its untapped potential. Some of you may already actually be participating in digital discipleship and not realize it. And so part of this presentation is to get you to be intentional. So small actions can have a huge impact on the lives of others. So becoming a digital disciple really just means being intentional with how you spend your time online, paying attention to others' posts and what they're saying and, and you know, proactively reaching out to them online or via tools and taking action in appropriate and timely ways. And we'll get into how we have to go beyond the thoughts and prayers, you know, mentality. Now, as a digital disciple, and again, this will be in the um, resources you can download, but you can consider the following commitments. Um, they should seem familiar because they're basically just from the NAD resource, Growing Fruitful Disciples, just modernized a little bit, just tweaked. It's basically, you can commit to building networks of support and friendship. You can look for needs, express needs that people are sharing in digital spaces. People share an unbelievable amount of information online. You can find ways to minister to them. A good example is, you know, someone loses their job, you can order groceries for them. Um, I remember with COVID, I knew a few people who lost their jobs, so I have experience with resume writing. I help them with their resumes or whatever. We all have something that if you're paying attention, you can offer, um, whether that's, you know, cash apping them money, purchasing groceries, offering your professional skills or services for free to help them. There's a lot that we can offer if we're paying attention. But we can always just respond mercifully to those discovered needs in a, in a relevant way. Um, people are kind of fatigued out on the thoughts and prayers. You know, what speaks to people right now is the gospel of action. Um, we can act compassionately on behalf of people who are disadvantaged. We can always pray for the Holy Spirit, pray for that guidance. Um, we can use our influence to share our, our personal story of what Jesus is doing in our life. Um, we can give a reason for our faith when asked. Um, you can obviously share your personal relationship and then just being willing to be humble and honest with your own spiritual journey and how you do life with faith and, and what that looks like as a Christian. You can also, you know, as a church, I, I want you to understand that nearly everyone is on some kind of social media or digitally connected. Like we have a member of our church who's you know, probably giving Methuselah a run for his money. And she is, she has email. She's on every Zoom Bible study. Like she, she's going for it. And what you can do is even if you have an older congregation or you yourself are older, you probably have email. 
you, you probably have the ability to text via phone and send people links or messages of encouragement or something like that. You have a way to interact with people. So don't assume that others are not connected. Ask and find out. Because even a small church, if they commit to these ideas of being a reach vehicle for souls and embrace a culture of sharing and content engagement, a small church of 50, if just half, if just 25 were on social media and were connected to just 50 people in the community, that's a potential reach of 1,250 people. You've grown your reach exponentially. Um, and, and so, you know, in a pod, the church members can agree to comment, like, and share content on a regular basis from the church. They can, they can forward emails and links to opportunities, videos, etc. And, and they can just agree to share their own faith through personal experiences. This is one way to get your congregation, um, you know, kind of involved in very practical ways. And here are just some tips for those of you in leadership position where you can um, basically take time to equip and train and encourage others because a congregation that understands the value of participating in ministry this way could serve as a powerful reach vehicle for souls. So they realize this potential, they have to be equipped, they have to be empowered, they have to be encouraged, they have to realize that this is legitimate ministry. So take time in your meetings, show them practically with hands-on training how to participate. Ask them, instead of telling them to put away their phones, ask them to take out their phones and take action in the moment. One of the things I like to do is when I do the welcome at my church right now, I encourage people to take out their phones and connect with others that they haven't seen in a while, see how they're doing, um, you know, minister to them just via friendship and connection. You can have someone who posts about key events to community apps like next door. You should be doing a toy drive or right now our church is doing a coat drive for the homeless and the needy. Like you can post about those events and get more community involvement um, or people who need toys and coats. You know, they can find out that way. Um, you can encourage others to invite people to events on Facebook via email texting to share content that way. Um, if they want to be really passive, they can just like your content. Most of your members are probably on Facebook, so that's why I keep saying like. But if they're on other platforms as well, that can also be helpful. Let them know when to expect emails and ask them to forward to their contacts if you're having some kind of a special event or a special message. You can send out weekly emails with content that you want them to share and engage with. Keep them posted on their event. Become sort of like their cheerleader and say, because of this, you know, we're getting, we've grown our online viewership X amount or whatever. We're reaching more people or here's a testimony from someone. And get them excited through your excitement. And I will say this, as a professional communicator, when you're sick of your message, your audience is just starting to get it. So always over communicate because people are busy. We're inundated. We're, we, we got so much coming at us at all, at all times. So. In a later presentation, we'll talk about the rule of seven and how that ties into communication within your church and for promoting certain things. Um, so now we're going to go through sort of these practical steps for how to engage in active digital discipleship through, you know, community building online and using your influence to share the gospel and improve the well-being of others. And so I will say this before we get into those practical steps. The reason many efforts are unable to succeed is because they lack clear direction. So I highly recommend that if using your digital influence for our ministry is new to you, choose one purpose. And then think creatively about how to use your influence, your available tools, and time spent online to fulfill that purpose. So keep it very focused. Um, now, your purposes may include, I've just offered four categories here and again this will be in that downloadable sheet but you can use your influence to create awareness about services and events to share the gospel and spread hope you know even if you're not creating the content yourself you could just be sharing content that church entities or your pastor is creating um, you can minister to those in need. Again, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but if somebody has an express need, how can you meet that need? How can you let them know that you're with them on the journey? Um, contact them, pray for them, stuff like that. And you can grow participation and community so you can get more people involved in your Sabbath school groups or your Bible studies or in your volunteer opportunities to serve the community. So those are some purposes you can choose. So. A lot of people, you know, they, they kind of get stuck at this first step, and that is, how do you get started? I don't know the first thing about being a digital disciple. All I have is a, is a smartphone and an email address. Well, 
it doesn't matter if it's text, email, Facebook, Instagram. Connect with people within your own faith community and beyond. Connect with your neighbors. Connect with the parents of, your, you know, kid, if your kids go to public school or whatever. Connect with the other families there. Encourage your members to do the same because you can't reach others and share the gospel or minister to their needs if you aren't connected to them. So build a network of ways to connect with people. Like in our little cul-de-sac where we live, we have a group text. We follow each other in social media. So I'm learning about the lives of my neighbors and finding ways to minister and help them. You know, And then once you understand people and connect with them, go where they spend their time. You know, I, hear, I also hear often from fellow Adventists that they only know Adventists. And they aren't connected to any online that are not Adventists. And this kind of blows my mind because I'm a convert, but I get it. I get it. You know, if you only know Adventists, don't underestimate your ability to minister to those still within your network because you don't know what struggles they're dealing with you something you post might be the one thing that keeps someone in the church your care for them online and reaching out to them and practically ministering to them could be their lifeline to faith it could be could be the opportunity for them to to cling to jesus so even if you don't know anybody who's not Adventist, you still have an opportunity to serve in this capacity because just like the lost coin that was lost in the house, it didn't know it was lost. We have people in our pews who are hurting, they're suffering, and they also need a stronger faith community and, and that connection of people ministering to them. And we never know the struggles that others are dealing with. But start purposeful, start small, reach out to those around you because ultimately building community online isn't really any different than in real life. Um, every opportunity to connect is an opportunity to advance the kingdom of God. These, you know, these ideas are built upon biblical models of outreach and evangelism. But the cool thing about digital tools and technologies is they allow us to listen more closely to our community and to scale up friendship evangelism and meet people's needs by staying more connected. We can follow up with people weekly by just simply sending a text. We can hear about people's lives just by scrolling through our Facebook feed. And I love this quote. Being listened to is so close to being loved that most people cannot tell the difference. Um, and when I search online, there seems to be two different ways to spell his last name. So that's why that little parenthetical there. But God is love. And Jesus came near to those he wished to serve. People share an amazing amount of information, of personal information online. So go online with the intention to listen to what people are sharing. So it's less about you and sharing your like lunch for the day. It's about using these connections to build relationships. Let people know that you are truly interested in their lives and that you care and are with them on the journey. You can pick just a few people, three to five people to focus on that you think you can reach or influence, and you can pray for them every day, and you can search their channels every day to see if there's some connection you can make, something you can learn, or some way that you can minister to them. Now, your goal in using social media or any tool for digital tool for ministry is to ultimately be able to understand and to fulfill a need to make a tangible impact on the real world. Because remember, what did Jesus do? He met them with their felt need in the moment. Then he bid them come and follow. So this means listening and taking action on a daily basis. So because remember, what starts in the digital space is not confined to the digital space. So here are some tips um, for scaling up friendship evangelism. You can connect, learn about people's lives, engage, show interest, um, you know, use digital tools to inform and invite. Take advantage of opportunities to serve people. Like I said, you know, you can send them groceries. You can um, call them and pray with them when they've lost a loved one. Recently, somebody I know lost both her parents to COVID. And so one friend organized, um, like, just a little, like, it wasn't GoFundMe, but, like, basically through Cash App, we got together through WhatsApp and sent money to help with, like, food and some other issues. And I reached out to the friend that initiated that. And I said, you know, you're being a digital disciple right now. You are dealing with a very real felt need. This family, these kids that are young adults are in crisis. They've lost both their families. And you're using digital tools and technologies to minister to them in a very real and practical way. 
because she herself is a very vulnerable person. So, you know, but from the comfort of her home, from the safety of her home, she can do all this ministry and all this love and pour into this family that is in crisis. That is ministry. That is digital discipleship. It's using these tools and technologies to meet that real need. And the interesting thing about this family is not all of them are still in the church. So, you know, this action of love that our community got together might encourage some of the siblings to try faith again. So listen more than you speak, start meaningful conversations. And of course, we can follow up very easily. We can shoot a text once a week to see how someone's doing with an issue or, or something like that. It's never been easier. Now, when we go online with purpose, we can build those relationships and trust by taking daily action and purposely understanding the felt needs of others without judgment and finding ways to practically improve their well-being. So, and Ellen White talked about this really beautiful concept of benevolent disinterest in her Ministry of Healing book. And, and basically, she's saying you do good just to do good, no strings attached. It's no like, I'll help you, but will you come to my Bible study? It's we just do good. We pour into people love and mercy and kindness and is as part of a holistic approach to ministry and so that people will be drawn to Christ through you because you've shown them unconditional love and acceptance and care for them. And so this ties into, you know, Romans 12, 15, which is rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So you can show people through your actions online and through digital tools and technologies that you see them, that you care about them and that you're there for them. And I assume you're empathetic people, but this is an opportunity with what people share online to find practical ways to speak faith into people's lives and to minister to them. Here's some more practical tips. And what I always do is when I go online, I ask myself, what prayer can I answer by simply paying attention? And to, to do that, I ask questions when people post things. Oftentimes, someone will post something if they're you know, struggling with something. I'll direct a message and ask them questions. I'll make it more private. I try to respond in a meaningful way. Um, practice reflective listening, ask and clarify like what they're saying. I seek to understand their felt needs. Every individual, I see if there's a way that I can practically help them. I pray for them. I often send recorded prayers, which for me has been really life-changing because it, it's, it's very, it makes you feel very vulnerable to record a prayer to someone. And then they actually get to hear you petitioning for God because if they're in a moment of crisis, they may not be able to pick up the phone. They may not be able to, or maybe they don't even want to pick up the phone because of the situation that they're in, but they can still hear you uh, petitioning God on their behalf. Um, you can take action. Of course, you can follow up. So these are just some steps that you can rinse and repeat when you have somebody that you're trying to minister to do. Now, building trust requires transparency, integrity, and authenticity. Here are some elements of trust building. Always be open, objective, honest. Don't do any bait and switch. Don't try to be manipulative to get them into your Bible study. Just be open and honest. Respect others' privacy. So when somebody tells you something, make sure that you honor their privacy in all that you do. Be vulnerable. Show that you can relate and that you're an imperfect human just like they are. But that faith is important for you. And, of course, some people ask, well, how can you be authentic in digital spaces? There's only it's snapshots of our life. But. To do that, you know, you want to talk about more than just your faith. People tune out if you don't show a whole person. You know, connect with people and their interests. People want to know that you're human. This is why we're drawn to personalities online because we can relate to them. We're inspired and we become interested in our passions. So you're not one dimensional. One dimensional. So when you showcase your whole life and how faith intersects with your life and how faith helps you live your best life, your faith becomes less foreign and more relevant to their daily lives because they see faith relevancy in your life. Be consistent, and I always am a little sad that I have to bring this up, but consider what perceptions people may already have of you and how you want them to view you. Uh, basically, people should always know what to expect from you. Um, are you a different person online than you are in person? Unfortunately, with politics and stuff like that, it, people can get really nasty online. So remember, it doesn't matter if it's online or in person. You're always reflecting Christ. Always remember that you're trying to draw people 
towards Christ and you don't want to push people away from faith just so you can win your argument. Now, the next step is to, once you've connected with people online, begin to build relationships and trust. This is all tie, tied together, but I just broke them out into different steps. But you can almost talk about them all simultaneously. But you can then seek to tend to their felt needs as Jesus did. So, you know, it's take action to alleviate the burdens of others because you're demonstrating the gospel of actions which speaks louder than our words and especially to the young generation that at-risk generation that is leaving the church because something you share or something you do could be at that critical moment that a questioning youth decides to give their relationship with god another chance and here's what i think is really fascinating and this might strike you as an overstatement but you can literally save lives through the gospel of action because when you look at the eight root causes of the 10 leading causes of the death, now this is from 2016, so it doesn't include COVID, but I'm sure it's no different. Um, outside, you know, this, I see eight ways of those root causes that individual church members could be ministering to others. I see eight ways that the church body could be strategically working to improve the lives of those in the community. You know, these are people dealing with internal, external stress, meaningless existence, and low self-esteem, self-worth. If, if you know that you're a child of God and you're creating his image and he counts the hairs on your head, you have self-worth. You have purpose in your existence. If you're lonely in social isolation, but then you have a church community, then that's got economic disparity. We can help with that. We can help with helplessness and emotional despair. We can give hope. We can lead people to wholeness and lack of information. We can offer education resources. There's a lot that we can do to attend to these eight root causes to reduce the 10 leading causes of death. And this is really, and this part I'm going to kind of skip through a little bit um, because we took a little extra time in the beginning. But there's this curious case of Rosetta, Pennsylvania. And in short, it was an Italian community from Rosetta, Italy that had moved to Pennsylvania. And they lived in this, you know, very common of this period because Italians weren't accepted into mainstream society. They formed their own communities, their own village. And what was interesting about this community is that there was no suicide, no alcohol, no drug addiction, very little crime, no one on welfare. They were literally just dying of old age. And that's it. No one under 55 died of a heart attack. And I can tell you, as someone who is half Sicilian, that is unheard of. Because I grew up believing, you know, in our community that was not as well tight knit as this community that Italians just had bad hearts. It's very common. A guy I grew up with just died suddenly at age 38, seemed to be physically fit, but his heart gave out. And it, you know, shock ripples through the community, but at the same time we're like, yeah, it happens among us, you know. Um, but what they found with this community it was so unique. They looked beyond the health of the individual and began studying the community. And what was different from the Italian community I grew up with in Rosetto, Italy, is that three generations lived under one, uh, Rosetto, Pennsylvania, three generations lived under one roof. People were connected through community. Neighbors took care of neighbors. Grandparents were respected. They were unified through church and civic engagement. They had created a powerful protective social structure capable of insulating them from the pressures of the modern world. They were literally healthy and only dying of old age because of the town that they created for themselves, the community they created for themselves in a small town in Pennsylvania. So they had transplanted that communal way of living from Italy at that time, you know, which is called Bazzani culture, which is peasant or village culture, um, to their new home. And I, you know, maybe I'm an idealist, but I believe that the church body can fill this community care gap that has become so large in our postmodern world. We can do this. We can be the community for people because what if every church and Christian offered a safe place to ask without judgment? You know, as Christians, often as we wall ourselves into a protective bubble and we don't know how to respond to the harshness of the realities that people face daily, too often we're guilty of responding in a way that feels like it's coming from a position of moral superiority instead of genuine care and compassion. But if we can offer people a place, a community that they can lean on without fear of condemnation, where we listen more than we talk and where our, under, our advice comes from understanding and compassion, People will find that the church, that faith is relevant. And, and this quote here is actually from my friend Erica Jones um, from this um, ministry we launched called Gorgeous to God. 
So like I said before, if church communities can extend beyond the building to a support system out of outside of church and online, we can use these digital tools and technologies to create a strong support system and network if we're all connected. But how many of us are even that connected among our own church? You know, we need to connect and, and strengthen our faith community and then go broader into the community. And so we should extend that church experience beyond the confines of time and space so that we can have this 24-7 thriving community. And this goes back to reframing how we view digital space and how we utilize our time online. And then the fourth point is we can share the gospel. So we went at all of this. Now we're to the point of sharing the gospel because it starts with community, it starts with relationship, and it starts with service. Then we can bid them come and follow, just as Jesus did, because people search online for answers to the problems. So what better place for the church to share our messages? We can be the voice that answers back. Something, a post that we create or a post that we share could become that aha moment for someone in your news feed, you know, who who then has, can have the time in that moment to to engage with us because ultimately we do not have a message problem we have a distribution problem we have the gospel the greatest story ever told we have the message of christ his birth his life self-sacrificing death resurrection and his soon return as the Adventist church we have the three angels message we we have the gift of prophecy and the guidance of ellen g white we have the ministry of healing we don't have a message problem. We have a distribution problem. And the way I see it is we have 20 million members worldwide, which translate into 20 million distribution centers worldwide. So can you imagine if we all took this role and this responsibility as seriously as some of us take our plant-based diet? Like I'm, you know, being a little cheeky, but, you know, it's true. And all you have to do is engage in something I call digital door knocking. That's the easy part. If you're online, if you can text people, if you can email people, you know, whatever it is, um, you can engage in digital door knocking. It's just simply when you share spiritual content on your social media profiles or through messaging, through email, through text that can uplift others, can create an opportunity for people to engage with you about your faith. And the great thing about this is social media allows us to share our faith and engage with our community when it's convenient for them. So it doesn't matter if it's three in the morning, if it's five in the afternoon, we don't have to like knock on the door and try and catch them in their home and not busy. It allows our audience to self-select whether or not they want to engage. And again, this ties back to authenticity. Are you someone they want to read this content from? Have they built a relationship with you online? Are you the same person online in person? Are you drawing them to Christ? Are you drawing them into this kind of content? You can, again, you don't have to create all the content. You can. I encourage individuals to share their story, to, to share the gospel, share what God is doing in their lives. Um, and But also you can curate content. You can share content that's impacting you, that's shared from others. I do encourage, you know, to personalize it as much as possible. So if you share, like, a blog post or something, you could say how it impacted you in the little part where you're sharing it. Now, don't just you know, flood your news feeds with content. Consider how their attitude or perception of God themselves or their situations change because of the piece of content that you shared. So there might be those three to five people that you're praying for, that you're targeting, so to speak, that you're trying to minister to. Think of content that you think would matter to them and then try and create or curate that content. We know stories are powerful because they never tell us what to think. They cause us to think, and they don't tell us what to feel. They cause us to feel. And we can tell the whole story. We can fill in the gaps for people. And we can paint accurate pictures that shares our human flaws and vulnerability. And, you know, stories are a way to connect to the human experience and see how faith is relevant in life. And people can see themselves in your story. Digital word of mouth is always going to be the strongest marketing mechanism for getting the word out because people are always going to trust the opinion of their friend or their family member over what a brand says about itself. Now, many of the digital ways to distribute this is similar to what we talked about before, so I won't go through it now. You can view it later. But, um, you know, we do this constantly, like whether it's a new chapstick we like or something we saw online. And with products, we're always digitally evangelizing for products 
or you know other things that we like or are interested in but we stop when it comes to the gospel so for young people if you're a young person listening to this i'm asking you to do the thing you always do but do it for the gospel you know you're always talking about you know whatever it is that you like the new restaurant whatever now do that for the gospel now the last point is be accessible be responsible because if you're going to put content out there you're going to talk about your faith you're going to share you're going to reach out to people ask them what they need you're going to seek ways to minister to them be prepared when people engage with you people often feel safe behind their screens so when they reach out to you don't leave them waiting fearful that you may have rejected them i have many conversations in my direct messages and text messages going on with people that are sort of continuous conversations of people i'm trying to witness to or minister to or help um, make sure you're responsive and that you know they feel heard so give options make it sure it's easy it's clear for people to reach out to you um no strings attached you know some people like to do the prayer post where if you just like this post they'll pray for you by name that's also really helpful and easy check daily um so if you're one of those people that have like a thousand unread emails or like a thousand unread text messages i have a friend that's like that and every time i see her phone and that little bubble it's it gives me anxiety because I'm definitely very type A. Like I have to always clear out all the all the little red circles. I can't handle it. But get into a better habit. Marie Kondo your inbox. Clean it all out. Make sure that you can catch those direct messages when they come in, those text messages when they come in. Because otherwise, someone's going to reach out to you and they're going to get silent. And that's going to hurt worse than if they had never reached out to you. And then respond quickly. You can download relevant apps for on-the-go engagement. And if what they're asking you is something that you really have to think about, maybe you're going to have to do research. We do this with our own ministry all the time, Angels in the Clan. We'll get a really heavy question. We will reach, we'll, we'll respond to that person as soon as possible. And we might say something like, we can't, you know, my husband's writing a sermon this week. We can't get back to you. and We want to take our time to, to answer thoughtfully. You'll hear from us this weekend. And so we'll reach out, we'll let them know that we're praying for them, that we've got their message, they were heard, and then we give them an expectation as to when they'll hear back to us, when they'll hear from us. Now, when we do this, we're going to have to evaluate success differently. Because digital discipleship is ultimately a long tail game, and many efforts fail because people give up too soon. I'm always amazed at the personal feedback I received sometimes months later from something I posted that I didn't really think did much. Um, we will never know our full impact of what we've done this side of heaven, but we must be consistent and persistent. So remember that intentionality with how we use our digital influence is really important. So here are some questions you can ask yourself to see if you're succeeding as a digital disciple. You can ask yourself, how many times have you shared the love of Christ online? How many conversations did you start or engage with on social media? Are you painting a more authentic picture of yourself, your faith of the church? Are you building relationships? Do you better understand the needs of those you're connecting with? And have you found meaningful and practical ways to minister to them? And, and that one to me is the big one. Now, um, I, I want to close this portion with just a really powerful quote and call to action from my favorite theologian. Because when I read this, I was like, Yes, and I wish I would have included this in the book, but I, I hadn't read it yet. But this is what she has to say. Long has God waited for the spirit of service to take possession of the whole church so that everyone shall be working for him according to his ability. Remember, it doesn't matter wh whether you have four followers or 40,000. It's according to your ability. When the members of the church of God do their appointed work in the needy fields at home and abroad in fulfillment of the gospel commission, the whole world will soon be warned and Lord Jesus will return to his earth with power and great glory. See, I believe digital mission, a digital revolution for Christ will be the loud voice. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But it seems like it could be really likely that if we're all using our digital influence, we could be that loud voice that proclaims um, Christ soon return. So Christ commits to his followers an individual work, a work that cannot be done by proxy. Ministry to the sick and the poor and the giving of the gospel to the lost is not to be left to committees or organized charities. Unfortunately, we advocated a lot of our personal roles to just the leadership or the conference or, you know, it's always someone else. It's never us. Like we need to take that individual responsibility, individual effort, personal sacrifice. That is the requirement of the gospel. So if you haven't got the book, you can get it from Advent Source or Amazon. 
you can read more about it on my website at jdim.digital slash book. So yeah, so any questions? Thank you so much, Jamie. What a blessing to have that presentation. I learned a lot here, um, including I didn't know about Rosetta. It's in my own home zip code. It's about 40 miles from the little town near where I grew up. And um, oh, really? that was a good insight of what community. Yeah, not that far away. I know it's a very, very small town. I just looked it up while you were mm -hmm. talking. Um, mm -hmm. because I know some of the names of the towns around it, Wind Gap and Stroudsburg and so forth, but uh, that's mm -hmm. a tiny place, but it's on the map because of what they experienced. So that sense of community like they had in Rosetta mm -hmm. obviously made a huge difference. It apparently, um, it was the, the thing that helped propel forward some research into the, the impact of stress on heart disease mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they had lower mm -hmm. stress because of their, their mm -hmm. tight mm -hmm. community there. And mm -hmm. so in a world where people are feeling so fragmented and disconnected today, um, we can use digital content to make connections where people are lonely. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering, as you shared, can you tell us, I know you have to protect privacy of people, but can you give us yeah. um, a real life example of how something that you've done digitally with media has yeah blessed a life and connected them to the community yes so again and Can i'm being vague and i yes I, and i'm going to be vague um because again protection and I, I i hope someday the person actually hears me talk about sure. this because they're not actually a member of the church yet but during covid there was an international student somewhere i won't say where <laughs> and they in the united states and because of COVID, they basically like lost their job. Like they couldn't work to be a student at the college or something like that. And they were trying to figure out groceries and like all this stuff. And I saw that online. And so I said to, the, I reached out to them directly and I said, well, can I help you? And so I actually started sending them grocery money and sending them grocery. And so that really impacted them. And then from there, we started having conversations about faith and, and all that kind of stuff. And again, there's that other example where there's another young woman and i see this all the time and a lot of it's like just very personal examples that we don't think of as digital ministry but you have people that are setting up gofundme accounts for people in crisis or families in crisis because they've lost like a loved one because of COVID or whatever um where another story and this one i don't have to be as vague it's mount pisca down in florida we were running a digital evangelism campaign down there and someone tuned in had been following us and she was in a situation and again i'll be vague with this part where she had fled a domestic violence situation and she was living in a hotel with her child and she didn't have money to keep paying for the hotel and so that particular church was a large church and they had structures set up where they could meet people's physical needs as well as their spiritual needs and they have like a prayer teams and all that kind of stuff and Bible studies. And they actually found a contributor within the congregation who paid for, um, who paid for the hotel room for like through like the next week or two weeks or something like that. And then because it was such a large church, they also had counselors and other people within the church who had experience with domestic violence and, and stuff like that who then connected with her counseled her told her where to go to get resources and help and it ended up being like this whole community effort to help this one woman and child and it started with a piece of content that was posted online mm -hmm. in florida but the person they ministered to was in a different state and so for me to keep it vague i won't say where but a distance away but then they ended up calling the local church where she was located and there they were able to like move her like into a safe house like it, 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 it was pretty cool like not her situation but the fact to see this congregation pull together they found out about her through this piece of content they had a, a plan for action a plan for response meaningful response and the ability and the willingness to meet the felt need, the emergency need in the moment, which was shelter. And then they connected with another church that then between counselors and all other like 
knowledge bases that different members had, they got her into a, a good secure situation. And it all started online. Yeah, it all started online. So yeah. a lot of people, you know, I'll hear sometimes people like, well, I want to do real ministry. Like, do you really think what happens in the digital space is confined to the digital space? Like, this is how we communicate. This is how we live our lives now. This is how we build relationships. More and more I, people are finding their spouses online. So we literally have met people and befriended people um, through online. Either they were listening to my sermons online or through Hope Sabbath mm -hmm. School. And we've we've mm -hmm. met. I've met their families. Um, mm -hmm. And we never would have met otherwise. And, uh, mm -hmm. and many of them are not members of our denomination, um, mm -hmm. but we now maintain an ongoing, you know, I get birthday cards from a, a little lady I'm thinking of, mm -hmm. sweet lady, you know, she sends me Christmas and anniversary and birthday cards. And it all started through online connections mm -hmm. like that. And, uh, and mm -hmm. then we can share more with them. Um, we're coming mm -hmm. to a close time, but I, I know it's tight, but I want to just say one thing that I thought was, it just clicked with me when you said, the Adventist Church has 20 million members worldwide, which means we have 20 million distribution centers. Is that the term you use? Distribution center? Yes. Or yeah. Yeah. Wow. That just hit for me. Like, what if every one of us was actually doing what God expected yeah. and being distribution yeah. centers for the message that we have? How much more yeah. rapidly would we be able to see the work go forward? Beautiful. Yeah. And, you oh. know, if for people who don't feel comfortable creating their own content, just share content. Just share. Just yeah, that's people. a good insight. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can I mean, be a we, curator and share. You don't have to be a creator of content. Yeah. And so and I always say, like, distribution is sort of the lowest barrier to entry. Like, everyone yeah. can be a distributor. You don't have to be a content creator. If you're not good at storytelling, maybe you're not really able to share your own personal story. But... You can minister and you can help people, but at the very least, you can distribute. Amen. Well, I want to be respectful of your time and the time of our viewers. And I, I, it just flew by so quickly. And so we're at actually a little bit over time. And I want to thank you, Jamie. We're looking forward to four more presentations. You're with us mm -hmm. uh, for the next four sessions. And it's mm -hmm. going to be different content every time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. viewers, I would encourage you keep checking in and okay. come back. We also have uh, new presenters every time. So you'll you'll have an opportunity to hear the next one, February 19, is going to be uh, John Bradshaw from It Is Written, and Great. Jamie Dawn will be back with a new presentation. Yep. So please keep yep. that uh, on your calendar. Thanks again, Jamie. We wish you God's blessings to you and your husband and your daughter and your ministry yep. together, too. Yep. I, mean, I will say I need to update my bio. I have two daughters now. <laughs> oh, you have two. All right. Yeah, so I them. just had a baby. So. <laughs> How old are they? Um, six months. So I guess maybe not just had a baby, but it yeah. feels like it. Six months and then two years and four months. Yeah, because when I knew you, you weren't even Mrs. Dom. <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Dom with two daughters. That's great. God's blessing yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very May much. May I pray with you or for you? Yes, of Father, course. Please. Father in heaven, thank you so much for um, speaking to our hearts today, for giving us new insights and ideas and understanding. Uh, from Tom's presentation and from David's presentation and from Jamie's presentation. And uh, I just want to pray for your blessing on all of them. And in particular now, um, having just heard from Jamie, we want to lift her up to you. We thank you for what she's uh, shared and we pray for your blessing on her and her family and their ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I'll make this presentation available as well for those of you that want to know. appreciate that. Appreciate that. God bless you. Happy new week, everybody, as we're uh, getting into a new week here. And we wish you all of God. Okay. Cool beans.